Hello, hi, mabuhay! Magandang umaga at magandang araw sa aking mga nagbabapuhan at naggagandahan mga mag-aaral. So, uh, we are now at your module 3 on this semester. On this module, uh, it says here, with the current COVID-19 pandemic, it remains important for you to adhere to healthy body movements or healthy movement guidelines to maintain a healthy immune system and build a strong defense. Engaging in healthy lifestyle and physical activities like walking, jogging, and running, stretching are important to help combat feelings of depression and anxiety. Walking, running, um, stretching, bending, catching, and throwing all our motor skills, they are all the building blocks of all games and activities in physical education class, sports, and daily life. Enhancing the quality of your motor skills can enhance the quality of the activities in a physical education program and your daily lives. So, in this video, you will learn about the scientific basic movements uh, to help you to be aware of physical literacy which help you move competently and confidently in all types of environment. So this also prepares you for the advanced learning of our movement because you are now in movement enhancement. So in your movement enhancement, you will learn about the, the function of uh, the two organ system in our body which has something to do with body movements and these systems are muscular and skeletal system. Now, since I have no expertise in discussing scientifically the different concepts in skeletal and muscular system, I cited videos that will surely help you discuss and explain what are the different concepts that you are about to learn in skeletal and muscular system all about those organ system which has uh, a connection to your body movements professor dave again let's look at the human skeleton he knows a lot about the science stuff professor dave explains now that we've learned about the structure of bones, we are ready to take a look at how they are assembled in the body. The skeletal system is comprised mainly of bones, around 206 of them in an adult to be specific. But there is also a good amount of cartilage, joints, and ligaments, which all together make up around 20% of a person's body mass. We will get to joints a little bit later. First, let's check out all the different bones in the body. As we recall, there are two sections to the human skeleton, those being the axial skeleton, made of the skull, vertebral column, and thoracic cage, and the appendicular skeleton, made more or less of just the limbs. Let's go through the axial skeleton first, starting at the top with the skull. The skull is a fascinating structure, made of 22 different bones. Cranial bones are the ones that protect the brain, and facial bones are the ones that give structure to the face. Most of the bones in the skull are flat bones, and in the cranium, these are connected at serrated lines called sutures. The cranium is made of a vault as well as a base, and we should note that the base is divided into the anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossae. Together, these produce the cranial cavity where the brain sits. There are also ear cavities and nasal cavities, as well as orbits, which house the eyes. Altogether, there are eight cranial bones. There is the frontal bone, two large parietal bones, the occipital bone, two temporal bones, the sphenoid bone, and the ethmoid bone. The cranial bones are connected, as we said, by sutures, and those have specific names as well. These are the coronal, sagittal, lambdoid, squamous, and occipitomastoid sutures. 
We should also mention the foramina, which are holes that nerves and arteries and veins pass through, most notably the foramen magnum at the base of the skull, through which the spinal cord passes. Moving on to the facial bones, of which there are 14, we can start with the mandible, which is the lower jaw bone. Then there are maxillary bones, which form the upper jaw and part of the face. Next, we have two zygomatic bones, which are the cheekbones, nasal bones, which make up the bridge of the nose, lacrimal bones, palatine bones, the vomer, and inferior nasal conchae. Lastly, technically not part of the skull, there is also the hyoid bone, which sits just below the mandible and does not connect with any other bone. Next up in the axial skeleton is the vertebral column, also called the spinal column or simply the spine. This is comprised of 26 irregular bones that come together to form a flexible structure in a curvy S shape. And this supports everything from the skull to the pelvis. The spine can be divided into five sections. At the top, we have the cervical vertebrae which are the first seven. The next 12 are called the thoracic vertebrae. The remaining five are called the lumbar vertebrae. We should note that the vertebrae get larger as we go down in order to support more and more weight. Below the vertebrae, we can find the sacrum, which is actually five vertebrae fused together. And lastly, below the sacrum, there is the coccyx, otherwise known as the tailbone, which is made of a few tiny vertebrae fused together. Of course, there is much more to the spine than just the vertebrae. There are lots of ligaments keeping everything together. The main ones are the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments, running down the front and back of the column from the neck to the sacrum. There are also shorter ligaments that connect adjacent vertebrae, as well as intervertebral discs. These are cushiony pads made of a nucleus pulposus, which is the more elastic part, surrounded by an annulus fibrosus with lots of collagen. These are found in between each vertebra, acting as shock absorbers when we run and jump. Now let's look a little closer at an individual vertebra. These all have a body and a vertebral arch. The whole is called the vertebral foramen and the spinal cord passes through here, which we will discuss later. The vertebral arch is made of two pedicles and two laminae, and from these project various processes. These are the spinous process, two transverse processes, as well as the superior and inferior articular processes. The vertebrae vary slightly depending on where they are found in the column. Cervical vertebrae have a spinous process that is very short, a vertebral foramen that is large, and an additional transverse foramen to accommodate vertebral arteries. Thoracic vertebrae have a spinous process that is long and points down, and they also exhibit structures called demifacets, which connect to the ribs. Lumbar vertebrae, being much larger, have pedicles and laminae that are short and thick, as well as other slight discrepancies. The last part of the axial skeleton is the thoracic cage. This is essentially comprised of the sternum and the ribs, as well as a lot of costal cartilage. The sternum is a flat bone right in the middle of the thorax, and it is made from three smaller bones that have fused together. From top to bottom, these are the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. Then there are 12 pairs of ribs that project from the vertebrae. The first seven pairs attach directly to the sternum 
via sections of costal cartilage, and these are called true ribs. Then there are five pairs of false ribs, three of which attach to the sternum indirectly with costal cartilage joining the cartilage from ribs above, and then the last two are called floating ribs because they don't attach to the sternum at all. Ribs are flat bones that get longer going from pair 1 to pair 7, and then shorter again from 8 to 12. With the axial skeleton complete, let's move on to the appendicular skeleton. While this is mainly just our limbs, there are other components to mention as well. Let's start with the pectoral girdle. This is comprised of the clavicle, or collarbone, and the scapula, or shoulder blade, which together give structure to the shoulder, thereby attaching the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. The clavicle has a sternal end where it attaches to the manubrium and an acromial end, which joins the scapula. The scapula is a thin, flat bone, roughly triangular, and it has three borders, the superior, the medial or vertebral, and the lateral or axillary. From here we move on to the upper limb. This consists of the arm, forearm, and hand. Though colloquially we think of this whole thing as an arm, when speaking in terms of anatomy, it is just this upper portion that we call the arm. So let's start there. In the arm we find the humerus, a typical long bone with its greater and lesser tubercle, radial groove, medial and lateral epicondyle, radial and coronoid fossa, trochlea, and capitulum. Moving on to the forearm, we now see two bones, the radius and the ulna. These are connected all the way down by the interosseous membrane, a flexible ligament. The ulna is slightly longer with its olecranon and coronoid process. The radius goes from wide to thin the other way, with a thin head, the radial tuberosity, and a radial styloid process. From there we see the hand, which has many separate bones. The carpus, or wrist, is made of eight short bones called carpals. These are the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, and then the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Next we see the five metacarpals, which make up the palm of the hand, and they are simply named one through five, from thumb to pinky. These connect to the phalanges, which are the bones that make up your fingers. There are 14 of these bones per hand, three per finger, which are the distal, middle, and proximal phalanges, except the thumb, which has two, as it has no middle phalanx. Moving back over to the torso, we see the pelvic girdle. This attaches the lower limbs to the axial skeleton, just like the pectoral girdle did for the upper limbs, although this one has far less mobility and far more stability than the other. This girdle starts at the sacrum we described earlier and continues with two hip bones. These are made of three separate bones at birth, which fuse to become one by adulthood and we still describe the regions of the hip bone as being the ilium, ischium, and pubis. Lastly, the lower limb contains very thick bones, allowing us to run and jump effectively. The thigh is made of a single bone, just like the arm, and this one is called the femur, which is the largest bone in the body. Here we see the head, with a small pit called the fovea capitis. Then the greater and lesser trochanter, the intertrochanteric crest, the gluteal tuberosity, linea aspera, 
medial and lateral condyles and epicondyles, intercondylar fossa, and patella. From there we go to the leg, which, like the forearm, contains two bones, the tibia and the fibula. Again, we see an interosseous membrane between them. In the larger tibia, we see the medial and lateral condyles, the intercondylar eminence, tibial tuberosity, anterior border, medial malleolus, and fibular notch. The fibula is much thinner with its head and lateral malleolus. Then we get to the foot, which is similar to the hand. We see the tarsus, made of seven bones called tarsals. The biggest two, the talus and calcaneus, make up the ankle. Then there is the cuboid, the navicular, and the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bones. Next we see the metatarsus, with five long metatarsals, again numbered one through five. Also like the hand, we see 14 phalanges, three per toe, except two for the big toe, also known as the hallux. So that wraps up our basic tour of the human skeleton, at least from the standpoint of the bones, which are the primary component. But there are other structures that are critical to the function and mobility of the skeleton, and these are called joints, so let's move forward and learn about these now. We just learned about all the bones in the human body, but if these are so hard, how is it that the human body is so flexible and bendy? Such variety of motion is made possible by things called joints. These are found where bones meet, so let's go through the structure and function of all the joints in our bodies. First of all, we can classify joints either by their structure or by their function. If by function, we are referring to the extent of mobility that is provided by the joint. Synarthroses are immovable. Amphiarthroses are slightly movable. And diarthroses are freely movable. These each serve their own particular purpose within the skeletal system. Then if going by structure, we can discuss fibrous joints, which tend to be immovable, synovial joints, which tend to be freely movable, and cartilaginous joints, which exhibit a range of mobilities. Let's zoom in on each structural classification. First, with fibrous joints, there is a lot of dense fibrous connective tissue and no joint cavity to speak of. These joints are for connecting bones that don't require a lot of movement. There are three types of fibrous joints. These are sutures, syndesmoses, and gomphoses. We talked about sutures when we looked at the skull, and this is the only place we will find them. They contain many interlocking fibers of connective tissue that are connected to the periosteum of each bone, allowing them to tightly interlock and this tissue eventually turns into bone, or ossifies, so that by middle age, the skull bones are all fused together, at which point the sutures become synostoses. The next type of fibrous joint is syndesmoses. This is where bones are connected only by ligaments, which are bands of fibrous tissue. We see this connecting the radius and the ulna. Here the fibers are short, which prevents movement. And the last type of fibrous joint are gomphoses, which are like a peg in socket type of joint. This only occurs between a tooth and its alveolar socket, as the teeth are more or less embedded in these, and the ligament present is called periodontal ligament. Next, after fibrous joints, we have cartilaginous joints. Here, as one might guess, bones are connected by cartilage. These also lack a joint cavity and are not particularly movable. There are two types of cartilaginous joints. 
The first are synchondroses, which contain hyalin cartilage. Before, we mentioned the epiphyseal plate in long bones of children, which allow for bone growth. And that is an example of this type of joint. The first rib also has one of these between the costal cartilage and the manubrium of the sternum. The other type of cartilaginous joints are symphyses, and these are made of fibrocartilage. This is compressible, so these joints are meant to be shock absorbers. We can find these in between vertebrae and in the pelvis. Lastly, we have synovial joints. These are the ones that have an actual cavity filled with fluid, which allows for substantial mobility. Most joints are of this type, especially the ones in our limbs. The structure of these is more complicated, but let's note a few features. First, articular cartilage covers each opposing bone surface, protecting the ends of the bones. Then there is the joint cavity. This contains synovial fluid, which is very viscous, containing hyaluronic acid secreted by cells that are in the nearby synovial membrane. This fluid acts as a lubricant and reduces friction between the layers of cartilage. The synovial membrane, together with the fibrous layer that flanks it, comprise the articular capsule. And beyond that are some reinforcing ligaments, as well as nerves and blood vessels. Beyond this basic structure, some synovial joints have fatty pads or discs of fibrocartilage separating the articular surfaces. These are also known as menisci. Closely associated with synovial joints are often bursi, flattened fibrous sacs containing synovial fluid, as well as tendon sheaths, which are similar but much longer and wrap around a tendon. These serve to lubricate certain surfaces and reduce friction between adjacent structures. Now that we know about the types of joints and their structural features, let's learn about the terminology that refers to the types of motion they allow. Muscles, which we will discuss next, have an origin attached to an immovable bone and an insertion attached to a movable bone. When muscles contract around joints, we get movement, and we can describe this motion by referencing certain lines or axes, as well as certain planes of space. First, for synovial joints, there can be non-axial movement, which are slipping movements, uniaxial movement, which happens in one plane, biaxial movement, which happens in two planes, and multiaxial movement, which happens in all three planes of three-dimensional space. Beyond this, motion can be gliding, angular, or rotation. Gliding movement happens when one flat bone surface slips over another. This happens at the intercarpal and intertarsal joints, allowing for left and right wrist motion. Angular movement happens when the angle between two bones changes. An example of this is flexion, which decreases the angle of the joint, like when bending the head forward or bending forward at the waist. The opposite of this is extension, which increases the angle of the joint. Straightening your neck or elbow or knee will achieve this. And hyperextension goes beyond this, like when bending your head back, bending backwards at the waist, and so forth. Then there is abduction. This is motion of a limb away from the midline plate of the body, such as moving your arms up and away from your sides. Adduction is the opposite, moving a limb toward the midline plate of the body, like bringing your arms down to your sides. Circumduction involves making circles with a limb, such as arm circles. And lastly, rotation involves the turning of a bone around its own axis. This happens at hips and shoulders, and it can be categorized as either internal rotation or external rotation. 
Beyond this are some special movements that don't fit into these categories, like supination and pronation, which has to do with the radius moving around the ulna in the forearm, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion in the foot, as well as protraction and retraction of the mandible, among others. There is much more we could say about each individual joint, but since we have the basics covered, that completes our introduction to the skeletal system. Now we are ready to learn about the muscles that are attached to these bones and joints, which will give us a much better understanding of how the human body works. So let's check out muscles next. So we are now ready to learn about all the different muscles in our bodies by name, which together comprise the muscular system. There are hundreds of muscles in the body, so we won't name every single one, but we will go through some important points, as well as a number of the major muscles and muscle groups. First, how can we classify muscles? Let's start by grouping them according to function. We must realize that muscles specifically contract and do not expand, which means that muscles can only pull, they do not push. So complex motion requires many muscles working together in interesting ways. The four functions we will examine are as follows. First, there are prime movers, or agonists. These are muscles that have a primary responsibility in producing a particular motion. Muscles that oppose a particular movement are called antagonists. This can help provide resistance and produce more delicate motions. Next, there are synergists. These help the prime movers either by contributing additional force or reducing undesirable movements that could occur as the prime mover contracts. So we can think of synergists as stabilizers in a certain sense. And lastly, when synergists immobilize a bone, they are called fixators. This includes muscles that maintain our posture. So there we have prime movers, antagonists, synergists, and fixators. And interestingly, a particular muscle can exhibit more than one of these roles, depending on what kind of motion it is producing. Skeletal muscles also have specific names, and they are named according to any of seven specific criteria. Let's be aware of these criteria, even if we don't go over the name of every single muscle. First, there is muscle location. For example, the temporalis is adjacent to the temporal bone. Next, there is muscle shape. The left trapezius muscles are roughly trapezoidal in shape. Then muscle size. We will see words like maximus, minimus, longus, and brevis in a number of muscles. And these mean that the muscle is large, small, long, or short, respectively. Examples include the gluteus maximus and the gluteus minimus. Next, the direction of muscle fibers. Sometimes these run in a particular direction with reference to a particular line, like the midline of the body or the axis of a bone. Rectus means parallel, transversus means perpendicular, and oblique means at some angle. So the rectus femoris is a muscle whose fibers run parallel to the long axis of the femur. Next, we can consider the number of origins. Biceps, triceps, and quadriceps have two, three, and four origins, respectively. Then we can discuss the location where the muscle attaches to other structures. Here we list the point or points of origin followed by the point of insertion, such as with the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which has origins on the sternum and clavicle and inserts on the mastoid process. And lastly, we can name muscles according to the type of motion they produce, like a flexor, extensor, or adductor. With these criteria understood, we should have a reasonable capacity to know something about the function of a muscle from its name. Now let's look at different muscle shapes. 
the fascicles of a muscle, which as we recall are bundles of muscle fibers, can arrange themselves in a variety of ways to produce muscles in a variety of shapes. If in concentric rings, we can get a circular muscle, like the ones around the eyes and mouth. If they are spread out over a region, but all converge towards a tendon of insertion, that is a convergent muscle, like the pectorals. If they taper down to a tendon at two ends, that is called fusiform, like the biceps. If the fascicles run in a straight line parallel to the long axis of the muscle, that is a parallel arrangement, like with the sartorius muscle found in the thigh. And lastly, in a pennate muscle, fascicles are short and run at oblique angles, and they can be unipennate, where a muscle sits on one side of a tendon, bipennate, with muscle on both sides resembling a feather, or multipennate, which looks like several feathers inserted into the same tendon. These different shapes determine the range of motion that the muscle can produce. Any skeletal muscle can only contract by about 30%, so the muscles with fascicles that run parallel to its long axis will shorten the most, but sacrifice some power. The muscles with many fibers at oblique angles will shorten less, but produce more power. Now it's time to look at specific muscles as they are arranged in the body. As most viewers of this tutorial probably have no specific need to memorize hundreds of muscle names, we will display just a few major ones right now over the course of a few images. Should you feel the need to memorize any of these, feel free to pause the clip in full screen mode and take a screenshot for later reference. Otherwise, just try to gain a vague familiarity. If you decide to go into a medical field, don't worry, you will see a lot more of these later and you can memorize them then. So here we go. And with that, we have wrapped up our survey of muscle tissue, the mechanism of muscle contraction, and the muscular system. We mentioned that muscle contraction begins at the neuromuscular junction. So what are neurons all about? These highly specialized cells are part of the nervous system. And that's the end of our presentation. Goodbye.